So good evening and welcome to one and all. This is Ankita, the assigned moderator from Planet. Planet is India's most trusted and widely used digitech platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. Planet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by Indian College of Anesthesiologists. And topic of today's session is remarkable research publications right from the press. Now let's begin today's session for which I would like to invite Dr. Muralidhar sir to take over. So over to you sir, please present. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. I feel greatly excited and uh, proud to be in front of you to start this webinar. This is the third anniversary webinars of ICA. The Indian College of Anesthesiologists had its first webinar on the 13th July 2020. And hence then, we have been having regular webinars without a break on every Wednesday from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Indian Standard Time. What an amazing galaxy of startup anesthesiologists anesthesiologist we are in between today. These anesthesiologists are both from the country and from abroad. And uh, the form which is shown, uh, which was shown is the membership form. You may please become a member of the ICA and join hands with us in the progress of uh, academic advancement. And thank you for uh, uh, being with us. And then the upcoming events, one of the most important uh, upcoming event is the annual conference, which is of a international level, fourth international and 14th national conference of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists is being scheduled from 2nd to 5th November at Bangalore this year. Please join us and we will ensure that you get uh, the best um, academic event of the year. Thank you so much for this. And uh, today, as I said, we are having the third anniversary of, anniversary of the ICA webinars, where what we have done is we have uh, chosen uh, remarkable articles from the recent publications from nine journals. And each one of them will be presented for a eight to 10 minute period in a very succinct manner. And that will be followed by uh, the question and answers and discussion from the panelists who will be introduced to you right now. I'm uh, speaking to you from Bangalore and our first uh, uh, moderator is Dr. Jayashree Sood. She's the chairperson of the Institute of Anesthesiology of Pain and Perioperative Medicine at Sri Sarat Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. She's greatly associated with um, Indian College of Anesthesiologists. She's a founder member and trustee and the CEO of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. And she has a lot of raw laurels. And uh, I think I'll... Uh, um, go or I will leave it for you to read it on the board on the screen because if I read everything it will consume a lot of time and thank you Dr. Jayashree Sood for joining us and I would like to know if you'd like to say some few words before we actually start. Dr. Jayashree Sood. Yes, uh, thank you very much Dr. Murli. Uh, yes indeed I'd like to say a few words to the delegate sure, sure. The faculty. Uh, good evening to all and a special good morning to those who are joining us from the West. A very early good morning. Yes. Thank you so much for joining and a warm welcome to all of you. As Dr. Murlidhar has already told you all about the third anniversary and the webinars that we have been conducted, conducting every week without fail. In addition, I'd like to tell you about the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Besides the webinars, we have many academic activities. So if you go on to our website of www.ica.co.in, then you can come to know what are the other academic activities. Some of them that I'd like to tell you are various fellowships running in different cities of the country especially liver transplant, thoracic anesthesia, organ trans or um, uh, onco, onco anesthesia, and other, and of course, also the cardiac anesthesia at Bangalore. So there are several, you can have a look at the website, select and apply for those. 
uphold their stringent criteria for selection and then an exit exam. Besides these fellowships, we also then offer a fellowship of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, the FICA, as we say. That is, of course, again, a very stringent selection criteria. We also have a journal known as the JICA, that is the Journal of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, which I would recommend that you all read. And please, it is online free, so please go ahead. With these few words, I'd like to welcome you all again, and please enjoy this webinar today. Webinar today. Thank you, Murli. Thank you, Dr. Jayasis, for the introductory words, and uh, we really appreciate the uh, what you say. Next, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Radha Krishnan B, who really does not need any introduction. Uh, he is the chief trustee and academic chair of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. He is the backbone of this college and he has built uh, this college uh, to this level because of his uh, commitment, dedication, and uh, communication skills. With that, I would like to request Dr. Radha Krishnan to say a few words to uh they were mark this occasion of the third anniversary dr radhakrishnan sir he's muted yeah good evening my colleagues friends and participants from India as well as abroad. Welcome you all. Good evening, good morning, and good day. Well, you all know that we started in 2020 and we were able to do webinars uninterruptedly on every Wednesday till now. This completes our three year and today is going to be the third annual of our webinars. With your support, we were able to conduct excellent, bright educational programs, which helped a lot. And I am sure these webinars of Huawei's are since still archived, will be of help to all those people who seek for it. The webinars were quality material, starting from basics to the most modern things. And we hope we may be able to continue this webinar for some more period of time. And once again, I thank you all for the helps you're rendering to the Indian College of Anesthesiologists and wish you all the best in your career and life. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Radha Krishnan, for that uh, introductory words from you. Thank you so much, and we appreciate your commitment and dedication to the cause of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Thank you for being with us. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Baljit Singh, who is a ICA trustee, that is the college trustee, and he's the professor and HOD of anesthesiology at the GTBH Hospital New Delhi. Again, a prolific academician and a sought after speaker all over India and abroad. With that, uh, Dr. Baljit, we do have, I request Dr. Baljit to say a few words to mark this uh, occasion. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mulligar. I think it's a great occasion that we are having the third year uh, celebration of, uh, the, of the webinars that we are having. Uh, every Wednesday, it's been become, uh, the Wednesday has been associated with uh, academic yes. webinars, and I think this has uh, gone so much into the system that uh, we look forward to uh, every Wednesday. I think not just us, but uh, there are a lot of <clears throat> other friends who do that. I would like to encroach on the uh, presenters' time. So uh, let's listen to their expert talks. And uh, thank you so much for the opportunity given to me uh, to express my words. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a privilege to be part of, uh, uh, you know, of the organizing team uh, of these webinars. Thank you very much. 
thank you, Dr. Baljit Singh, for joining mm -hmm. with joining us and being with us. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Kumar Belani, who is a distinguished international professor at the Academy Health Center, University of Minnesota. He is also professor of anesthesiology and adjunct professor in medicine and uh, pediatrics at the University of Minnesota. He is currently the international dean for the Indian College of Anesthesiology. And I request him to speak a few words before we actually begin the um, webinar. Good evening, distinguished members of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, esteemed colleagues, and fellow participants. I am honored to welcome you all to the third annual webinar of the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Today, we gather virtually on this Zoom platform to embark on a journey of knowledge, sharing of scientific exploration, fueled by a common passion for advancements in anesthesia. This third annual webinar provides us with a valuable opportunity to review and discuss the most recent publications in our field. As you all know, our specialty is dynamic, constantly in evolving and driven by a commitment to patient safety, comfort, and improved outcomes. Keeping ourselves updated with the latest research findings and exploring these potential implications is vital to providing the best care to our patients. During the sessions, distinguished speakers and experts in the respective areas of expertise will present key publications highlighting their significance, limitations, and possible future directions. I would like to express our heartfelt gratitude to all the esteemed speakers, attendees, and organizers who have dedicated their time, energy, and expertise to make this event a resourcing success. Without further ado, let us embark on this exciting intellectual journey united in our common pursuit of advancing anesthesia knowledge, nurturing camaraderie, and ultimately enhancing patient care. Warm welcome to the third annual college Indian Annual Indian College of Anesthesiologists webinar. Thank you, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Dr. Belani, for that kind words, and uh, thanks also to uh, you know, for joining us in this uh, webinar. Before we actually start the scientific section of the day, I have a pleasant uh, job of introducing other, our other moderators. First in the list is Dr. Anita Malik, who is the ex-professor and HOD of the King George Medical University, Lucknow, UP. She's again a very profound academician and uh, uh, she has developed this modular training program to aid the uh, systematic approach to the training of the postgraduate um, students in the field of anesthesiology. We must congratulate her for having conceived this idea and um, bringing it uh, forth to the benefit of all the other anesthesiology trainees. Thank you so much for joining us. If we would like to say hello to um, um, the participants, you may please do so. Anita, are you there? Just say hello to the participants. Yes. Um... A very uh, good evening to uh, all the participants. We are uh, willingly and very patiently will uh, wait for uh, these uh, <laughs> publications uh, to be explored now. All the best. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Next, I'll be introducing Dr. Poona Manhotra. She's again a profound academician. She has the written books and the chapters, and uh, she's the editor in chief, chief of the Journal of Cardiac Critical Care which is being run successfully. In fact, one of the presentations will be from that journal. And she's the professor in the Department of Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology and Critical Care at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Dr. Poonam, please say hello to the participants. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Mulidhar and the entire ICA uh, chiefs as well as um, the presidents and everyone there to think of research and publications for the youngsters. I think it's a very wonderful idea to ask. So far, there was a hesitation that if I, if I 
speak on an accepted subject what happens and dr mulitha today you uh, made a reality that only published articles will be read so you're changing the side effect stream in a very positive way for more youngsters to come up and be more confident to speak at such podiums and very eagerly looking forward to all the presentations in a very big way thank you for putting us all together on a very good scientific podium for research and publications thanks a lot and thank you dr poonam uh, for joining us and we greatly value your presence next i would like to introduce dr keeti saxena who is the currently the editor of the journal of indian college of anesthesiology which is again a prominent uh, academic feature of indian college of anesthesiology and uh, she is the director and professor and head of anesthesiology at maulana azad medical college in new delhi and we are uh, greatly indebted to her for taking up the uh, onus of running the journal thank you so much dr keeti nath saxena and if you would like to say hello to the participants please unmute and uh, say a few words Uh, annual webinar, and uh, I just uh, request everyone to submit their papers to the journal. And uh, the better, the more the number of papers, the better will be our quality of publication. Yes. Uh, we can bring out more frequent uh, issues if we have more papers. So far, we are doing fine. Yes. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Keeti Nath, for joining us. And uh, please wait till the end of the session because the question answers will actually start from that point of time. And you may please join the discussion and add value to the whole webinar. With this, uh, I think we're all set to go ahead with the webinar, uh, scientific content of the webinar. And I request Dr. Vivek Kumar from uh, um, Mumbai, who is a very Uh, active academician and intensive care specialist who has taken a lot of pains to put all things together for today's webinar and i request him to take the uh, onus of conducting the webinar and we are looking forward to, to your contribution dr vivek thank you sir uh, good evening to all the senior faculty and welcome to all the delegates we start with the first presentation which is post graduate training in anesthesiology a modular curriculum this will be presented by dr monica kohli who is professor of anesthesiology at kgnu lucknow can we have the first presentation please Okay, so I will directly go to the presentation, yeah, sir. Yeah, first presentation. Yes, yes. Okay, just a minute, sir. very good evening to all 
respected chairpersons, seniors, and my colleagues. It's my honor to be a part of the anniversary celebrations of the ICA, especially sharing the platform with such stalwarts of anesthesia. So without further ado, as Dr. Kanchi has given me only eight minutes, let me start. So the article which we would be discussing is a postgraduate training in anesthesiology, a modular curriculum. Well, we as uh, say academicians or teachers, we want our trainee on completion of the training should be able to provide the highest quality of healthcare to advance the cause of science through research and training. Anybody would be justified in saying that the MCI or NMC, they have given a very elaborate and exhaustive uh, syllabus, which comprises of experience in basic subspeciality and advanced anesthesia training. So why the need for something new? So in our manuscript, we have proposed a scheme of modular training, which includes all the aspects of training and an objective assessment at regular intervals. So our basic objective, what we want to bring to the table is a uniformity, a uniformity in the postgraduate education in anesthesiology and uniformity in the assessment of the postgraduate trainees. Well, we are all aware that there is a lack of standardization in the residency program across the country. So in modular training, what we have suggested is that each individual module is a standalone and they can be assembled together to make the whole syllabus. So one can easily and conveniently customize the learning material to ensure completion of the requirements. Well, advantages are many. Of course, we would be having didactic lectures, we would be having seminars, small group discussions. But the advantage is that the mentor-mentee interaction is much more in modular training. There is self-learning. The students are encouraged to be up to date because of the regular assessments. So here you can see that the anesthesia syllabus has been divided into nine modules. Each module will be taught over a period of two months. So this complete syllabus would be over in 18 months and we would repeat the same thing again in the next 18 months. So uh, in the first six months, we would be uh, dealing with basically the theory. And in the next two weeks, we would be giving them written assignments and then finally the assessment. So this is basically the flow chart which we would be following. That in the first 45 days, there would be a clinical and academical sessions. Okay. Then topics would be provided for assignment, which would be either cases, it could be either uh, the, the, uh, the technical skills or the special investigations as per that particular module. Then they would be uh, asked to submit their assignments or at the end of the two weeks and then an assessment would be done as either as a viva or as a short, uh, short notes or uh, long questions as per the discretion of the department. One could also take it as OSCEs or MCQs. So the curriculum which we uh, which would be following would again have the three domains would be cognitive, psychomotor and effective. As you can see the cognitive part that the good knowledge base which we have to give would be given in the first six weeks. There would be interactive learning atmosphere. The technical skills are very important in anesthesia. So the psychomotor uh, domain has to be done properly. The separate the skills into different components and make sure that there is adequate provision for the students to practice under supervision. The effective uh, domain is sometimes uh, neglected, but yes, it needs to be done. And uh, uh, the, the trainee should be exposed to all the different types of teaching techniques. You should observe their responses, take their suggestions and give a consistent performance reinforcement. Thesis, research, logbook assignments, they all have to be done by the student. 
So these, uh, this is a screenshot basically of the two most important modules, that is the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. I would be dealing with the respiratory system in detail, so to give an overview of how each module would be looked at. So in the respiratory module, in the six weeks, one would be first doing the applied part of the anatomy, physiology, but pathophysiology, physics, and pharmacology. Then we would be looking at the airway assessment, difficult airway, then anesthesia for patients with respiratory disease for non-thoracic surgery, anesthesia for thoracic surgery, the monitoring part, the pulmonary function tests, recent advances, journal clubs, and whatever else you can think of. Then comes the next two weeks in which the clinical learning and assessment is done. The cases would be dealt with in this period. You could take up cases, say a COPD with lap coli. You could have, you can take up a, a one lung or ventilation and bronchial asthma. So each of these cases have been can be taught by either a case-based discussion or a problem-based learning or a, or a routine long case or a short case. Special investigations like x-ray chest, like ultrasound, like MRI, CT have to be taught. They can be taught either with films or they can be taught as OSCE or you can take the help of a radiologist and they can be taught. The technical skills in the respiratory module are many, uh, a double lumen tube insertion, fibro optic, a video laryngoscope, tracheostomy. So they can be taught by simulation or if a simulator is not available, then you can use a supervised, you can do supervised training or you can do an objective uh, uh, assessment of technical skills with the help of various checklists. So these are the cases. Uh, again, I've just taken a short uh, a screenshot of it. So as you can see in the respiratory system, you can do bronchial asthma, bronchial bronchoscopy, intercostal drain, etc. So the area of focus, which we feel that the, when you're making a module, the objectives should be clear. They should be competency-based and supervised and conducted by well-trained mentors. And also stress in addition to skills and knowledge should be laid on attitude, behavior, safety, communication, audit, ethics, and law. Evaluation we have already talked of. You can do an internal formative or a summative assessment periodically and do the final exam. So in summary, I would like to say that what we want is you want to transform a basic medical graduate into a perioperative physician. And this system, that is the modular training, would encourage a mentor-mentee interaction. It is objective and emphasizes, uh, envisages the equitable education all across the country can be provided. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monica, for a wonderful presentation and a thought-provoking presentation, which is all set probably to change the scenario of training. We now move on to the next topic, and that is the effects of prophylactic bolus of norepinephrine versus phenylephrine on maternal and fetal outcomes during caesarean section under subarachnoid block, a randomized study. It will be presented by Dr. Anjali Gera. Dr. Anjali Gera is a SR at Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. Over to Dr. Anjali, please. respected moderators, seniors, and their delegates. I will be talking about the effects of prophylactic bolus of norepinephrine versus phenylephrine on maternal and fetal outcome during LSES under subarachnoid block, a randomized study done in our department at Sir Gangaram Hospital. Subarachnoid block is the anesthesia technique of choice for patients undergoing LSES but is associated with hypotension, the incidence of which is reported to be 71%. Hypotension is associated with nausea, vomiting, and dizziness. 
and if left untreated may cause cardiovascular collapse and it may lead to insufficient uteroplacental blood flow, fetal acidosis, hypoxia, neurological injury. Sustained hypotension of more than four minutes has been shown to be associated with neurobehavioral changes. Now, what are the causes of hypotension? The gravid uterus, once the patient is made supine, presses on the major vessels, which causes decrease in preload. Sympathetic block results in arterial and venous dilatation and decreases systemic vascular resistance, although this is compensated by baroreceptor mediated increased heart rate and stroke volume, resulting in increased cardiac output. In patients with severe hypovolemia, there may be activation of cardio inhibitory receptors, resulting in precipitous fall in heart rate and blood pressure. Hypotension is managed by fluid loading, positional protocol, and pharmacological intervention. Co-loading with crystalloid is considered better than the preloading. Positional protocol, protocol with 15 degree left lateral tilt is uh, a norm in patients undergoing the cesarean section. Different vasopressors that are used for management of hypotension are ephedrine, phenylephrine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and nephentamine. They have actions on adrenergic receptors, direct or indirect. But which is the ideal vasoreceptor, vasopressor? Ideal vasopressor should be reliable, titrable, easy to use, and should be devoid of maternal and fetal side effects. So we studied norepinephrine and phenylephrine, their prophylactic policies in the management of hypotension in patients undergoing caesarean section with primary objective of the effect of drug on the incidence of maternal hypertension and secondary objectives or effect on maternal heart rate, incidence of reactive hypertension, intraoperative nausea vomiting, neonatal APGAR score, umbilical cord blood pH, and need for active neonatal resuscitation. The study was approved by Institutional Ethics Committee and was registered under CTRI, was done on 240 parturients, 120 in each group, and written informed consent was taken by all the patients. Randomization was done using online random number generator, and the patients were divided into two groups, norepinephrine or phenylephrine or PE group. Sample size was calculated, by referring to this study and the calculated sample size came out to be 697 but since it was a time-bound study we took 120 per group and did it as a pilot study. The inclusion criteria were term pregnancy, age more than 18 years, single pregnancy, ASA 1 or 2, weight more than 50 less than 90 kgs and height of parturient more than 150 centimeters or less than 170 centimeters. Patients were excluded if they had preeclampsia, hemoglobin eight, less than 8 gram percent, resting heart rate more than 120 per minute, if they are having cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease or renal impairment, platelet count less than 1 lakh, INR of more than 1.5, and if there was any history of fetal anomaly, they were excluded. Drug preparation was done by anesthesiologist not involved in the management of patient in the OR, for norepinephrine preparation, 0.8 ml of drug was taken and mixed with 100 ml normal saline so as to make 8 pints per ml of norepinephrine. For phenylephrine, 1 ml of 10 mg phenylephrine was mixed with 100 ml normal saline for making 100 micrograms per ml of phenylephrine solution. Prophylactic bolus was taken in 1 ml syringe, 0.5 ml of each drug. Potency ratio of 12.5 was used with this potency ratio 50 micrograms was of phenylephrine was equivalent to 4 micrograms of norepinephrine in potency. Standard anesthetic care was followed. Patients uh, IV excess was taken by 20 gauge IV cannula and standard co-loading was started with balanced salt solution. Baseline non-invasive blood pressure was defined as mean of three consecutive readings at one minute interval after a brief resting period. Subarachnoid block was given under full asepsis in sitting position using 27 gauge pencil point spinal needle at L23 or L34 vertebral interspace. 20 micrograms fentanyl plus 9 milligram of hyperbaric bupivacaine was used. 
patient was given 15 degrees left lateral tilt. Time points were defined as from subarachnoid block to achievement of T5 dermatomal block as T1. T2 was to skin incision and to the delivery of the baby was T3. First prophylactic bolus dose was given immediately after subarachnoid block. After the delivery of baby, umbilical venous cord blood plus was sent for ABG. APCA scores were assessed by neurologist, neonatologist at 1 and 5 minutes. Vitals were recorded. Hypotension was defined as systolic blood pressure less than 80% of the baseline value. And a bolus dose of study drug 0.5 ml was given as per the assigned group every time to treat the hypotension. If hypotension persisted after third rescue bolus administration, then methotamine of 6 mg IV bolus was given. Both the groups had similar demographic data, baseline laboratory parameters, and baseline hemodynamic parameters. Time T1, T2, T3, the surgical times were similar in and comparable in both the groups. Incidence of hypotension in any group was 59.1% as compared to 64.1% in PE group, but was statistically not significant. Number of episodes of hypotension were similar in both the groups. APGAR score and umbilical cord blood gases were also similar in both the groups. This is the serial uh, systolic blood pressure plotting uh, at different times and was similar in both the groups. Heart rate was significantly higher in norepinephrine group at 2, 3 and 4 minutes. So this was one of the largest studies on the use of prophylactic vasopressors. Both the drugs have favorable maternal and fetal outcomes. Norepinephrine Norepinephrine infusion, which is a standard first-line vasopressor in ICU settings, whether it can be used in obstetric setting where hypotension is transient and abrupt was our concern. When we compared our study with others like Wang et al., they reported they observed um, bradycardia with phenylephrine in their study. And also the same uh, thing, Shakli et al. also reported bradycardia with phenylephrine when they compared phenylephrine with norepinephrine. Although we did not uh, observe bradycardia in any of our patients, only six patients in norepinephrine group had bradycardia, less than 60 per minute, and seven patients in phenylephrine group had less than 60 per minute heart rate, and only one patient in either group had less than 50 per minute heart rate. This could be because we used a lower dose of phenylephrine, 50 micrograms, as compared to these studies where 100 microgram dose was used. Heart rate was significantly higher in norepinephrine group, as was observed in other studies by other authors also. This could be because of beta adrenergic effect of norepinephrine. Blood pressure variation was similar in both norepinephrine and phenylephrine group. There was no difference in systolic blood pressure at any point. This was in concurrence with other authors' observation. To conclude, both norepinephrine and phenylephrine are effective vasopressors in spinal anesthesia induced hypotension in parturient undergoing LSCS. Norepinephrine has better heart rate control than phenylephrine, and both the drugs were associated with favorable fetal outcome. Bolus dose of 4 microgram norepinephrine was found to be adequate to prevent spinal anesthesia induced hypotension. We recommend that more studies should be done in obstetric patients, especially with comorbidities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anjali, for a wonderful presentation. I'm sorry to have mispronounced you. Dr. Anjali is senior consultant. We now move on to the next presentation, which is a talk by Dr. Anuj Clerk. Dr. Anuj Clerk is the Head Intensive Care Services, Sunshine Global Hospital, Surat, Gujarat. And he will be talking to us on Arrest Outcome Consortium Registry Analysis, AOCRA. It's basically an outcome statistics of cardiac arrest in tertiary care hospitals in India. Analysis of five-year data of Indian online cardiac arrest registry. Over to you, Dr. Anuj.
Hello, I'm Dr. Anuj Clark. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Indian College of Anesthesiology Office Bearers for including our papers on third annual ICA webinar. Uh, as uh, I requested, this is my CV. And uh, today I'm going to talk about Arrest Outcome Consortium Registry Analysis, that is OCRAS 2022 paper published in Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine in May 2023. With me, Dr. Kunal Patel and Nikita were partner in designing this website named www.aocregistry.com, which is an online portal for to document a pool of the cardiac arrest data. Dr. Bhagyesh, Dr. Dawal, Dr. Ritesh, Dr. Jasmine has contributed and Dr. Bhavin Vyas has helped us in analyze, statistical analysis of this data. We have started collecting our data in January 2017 and uh, till 31st May data were included in this portal. Uh, so this is our CTRR registration details. We could find 22 studies reporting outcome from of cardiac arrest from India, out of which only two were multicentric and rest were single centric. And you can see that few of the OHCA and few of the IHCA were excluded. And that's why when you do gap analysis, you can see lots of red blocks, which uh, it prevents us from pooling this data in any form in meta analysis when we attempted the heterogeneity extent was so much that we could not even pull the data. And then once we found that, we decided to create a online web portal so that other hospitals can report their cardiac arrest anonymously. And this is our portal where today we have reached almost close to 3000 uh, cardiac arrest uh, data. And uh, uh, these are our list of publications from the registry. As far as OCRA 22 is concerned, we have no conflict of interest to declare and privacy of the patient hospital and the uh, rescuers are not disclosed in any way on the registry because the data is de-identified on source as each code number each uh, arrest entered into the database is uh, uh, given a code and uh, so the data is de-identified at source data is collected in standardized format aoc form a and uh, which is based on Houston template and once the data is pulled, uh, we uh, uh, analyze this paper uh, of last five years data. Uh, inclusion criteria followed in this study are any arrest about 12 years of age, except those who have DNR status or, or CPR was not performed because they are obviously dead on arrival and the code blue falls without cardiac arrest was excluded. As far as outcome is concerned, cerebral performance category was followed. Any category one and two where the patients are independent of daily activity of daily living are considered and uh, CPC more than three are considered poor outcome. As far as outcome analysis is concerned, out of total arrest, how many has uh, restored spontaneous circulation? How many were alive at hospital discharge and were their neurological outcome good or bad? And they are followed up six and 12 months. Other outcomes which are studied in this uh, trial was uh, age, gender, distribution of arrest by location, bystander, CPR, first rhythm, CPR, duration, admission, lactate level, and neurological outcome. Out of 2,333 patients, 2,121 patients were included because 114 were excluded as they deemed DNR and 98 data were incomplete entry. Uh, 1,113 patients ABG were available and that's why in lactate analysis only that many patients were included in that analysis. 70% were male and 30% were female, but female has little better survival, which is 10.3% versus male have 7.2%. And this survival difference is statistically, statistically significant on car square analysis as far as their survival alive at discharge as well as their good neurological outcome. As far as if we compare age group with this age group, 12 to 20 years has the best outcome and 91 to 100 years had poor outcome. But when you do the statistical analysis, we did not find the statistical difference between the age group. And that also holds true for the good neurological outcome. It calls for more questions rather than answering the existing one. The location of OHC is mostly at home in 70% and bystander CPR in OHC patients in our study, any form of chest compression then we included 25.2% has received some form of chest compression before arrival to hospital which is much better than the previously reported studies at 1.3% to 7.4% in India, which is much lesser than 
get with the guideline registry of USA, which has reported 41.6% bystander CPR rate and Danish registry has gone as high as 60% bystander CPR rate. But our numbers are too small at this moment to come draw any conclusion. Our database showed 16.7% ROSC rate and survival to hospital discharge was 8.2% and survival good neurological outcome was found in 6.6%. First rhythm VFVT has uh, almost 40% survival rate and the worst was in asystole and that is statistically significant even for good neurological outcome. In OHCA patients, the numbers are little better with 35.8% ROSC, 14.6% survival to hospital discharge and 5.7% good neurological survival. OHCA in also the first rhythm is statistically significant. If we study, we studied low flow and no flow time. In low flow time has uh, found co correlation with the outcome, but here we should understand that patients who have developed restored spontaneous circulation will always have low flow time. Survival is unlikely if no flow time is more than 40 minutes and less likely if low flow time is more than 60 minutes. That is a very important asset uh, type of analysis when we develop TOR rules for India in future. Uh, ROSC rate in IHCA was 15.5%, survival to hospital 7.7% and uh, good neurological outcome was 6.7%. Lactate, if we consider, though uh, survival, survived patients have a less, lower lactate than the non-survived, the data number is too small to conclude. And at this numbers, we did not uh, establish, we could not establish any correlation between the admission lactate and this. But that also opens more questions than answering one. We can discuss in the Q&A session. Multivariate analysis of uh, all the RS patients had First rhythm and low flow time has a uh, correlation uh, association. OHCA patients, no flow time and first rhythm, and IHCA patients at first rhythm and low flow time found some association between them. This is the uh, U-stain template uh, of reporting. That's the format all the uh, cardiac arrest outcome studies should be reported, and this is what we have reported. And as far as long-term follow-up is concerned, 173 patients were followed up, and uh, uh, 35 patients were alive at 6 months, 32 at uh, 12 months, but 80 patients data are uh, incomplete. Either they are lost to follow up or they are yet to complete 6 or 12 months in the study. There are less than expected numbers in this study because this study is uh, now onwards form of association with the hospital. So as the year advances, more and more hospital joins and that's why the number increases exponentially with no number of uh, very few uh, OHCA data. Nomenclature conflict is found in uh, one of the hospitals which are corrected. Arrest time inaccuracy and uh, low uh, OHCA uh, numbers are because exclusions are mainly from the OHCA rather than IHCA. And uh, outcomes are CPR outcome and not cardiac arrest outcome because DNRs were excluded. So to sum up, uh, we have started with one hospital, then eight hospital and 17 more hospitals are about to join. Once it large enough, this holds a very a uh, huge potential to create a large database which not only serves as literature for future guideline but help in uh, designing the healthcare planning as far as uh, AED placements etc is concerned and it can uh, serve as a holy grail for research in cardiac arrest in India and once we establish it which can create a huge database which can help us in many ways and uh, I, I will end with thanking the administrator for providing this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anuj. We now move on to our next uh, speaker. And that is Dr. Rashmi Singh, who will be presenting a paper on pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF-alpha as a prognostic marker in children with tetralogy of fallow undergoing an intracardiac repair. Dr. Rashmi Singh is a cardiac intensivist at AIMS, cardiac anesthetist at AIMS. Over to you, Dr. Rashmi Singh. Good evening, respected faculty. I am Dr. Rashmi Singh, DM Cardiac Anesthesia from All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi. And I will be discussing about the pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF alpha as a pronostic marker in children with etiology of alert and doing intracardiac repair. So, uh, as we all know, TOF is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease, and with the pathophysiological trait consisting of chronic hypoxia, polycythemia, and hyperviscosity, cardiopulmonary vipers induces inflammatory surges, which affect the hemostatic renal and cardiac system, and it prolongs the post-operative recovery and the length of hospital stay. 
Rise of level of inflammatory mediator may serve as a clue for post-operative organ dysfunction. Till date, there is no biotin chemical marker available to detect morbidity and mortality, and only available clue which we are using right now are the clinical features and blood test analysis. So, if we can incorporate any biochemical marker at this point, so that we can detect the early morbidity and mortality, and we can change the post-operative outcome, will be our idea. So, what is TNF alpha? It is a pro-inflammatory cytokine with major roles in the systemic inflammatory response syndrome secondary to cardiopulmonary bypass. So, many studies have been done on TNF alpha, but they were inconclusive because of small sample size and their diagnostic variability. So, our aim is to evaluate the changes in serum concentration of TNF alpha in a patient with TOF undergoing intercardiac repair and cardiopulmonary bypass, and we'll be seeing code changes it's in its level with the clinical outcome and the patient mortality. So it is a prospective type of study and the sample size were calculated using Stata software. So it was based on the area under curve for TN alpha based on the previous literature of a level for TN alpha. Considering the alpha area of 0.5% in a power study to 90% and area under curve were taken 50% in the patient population for TN alpha. We have calculated sample size to 147. So for simplicity, we have taken 150 as a final sample size. So 150 top patients aged between 1, 1 to 20 years of age uh, do collective ICR we're taking on the patient and we have divided patient into two groups. Group 1 will be patient up to 15 years of age and group 2 will be more than 15 years of age. Any patient with pre-existing cardiac failure, coclopathy, renal failure, immune and CNS dysfunction, any infection and the patient taking any anti-inflammatory therapy will be excluded from our study. So we have measured T alpha level using ELISA technique and the minimal level dose were 0 0.5 to 5.5 picogram per ml. So three blood samples were taken. First is a T1 that is taken in baseline just after induction. T2 is after cardiopulmonary bypass that is 20 minutes after the protamine administration. And T3 will be 24 hours after surgery in the ICU. And we have noted following parameter, intraoperative cardiopulmonary bypass duration, duration of post mechanical ventilation, use of phenotropics, use, uh, length of ICU stay and the hospital stay. So results, this is the table showing the demographic data and the perioperative variable. If we if we can clearly see that the with respect to age, gender, cardiopulmonary bypass in the cross clamp time, there is no difference between the group and the group two. However, duration of ventilation, duration of final drop use, length of ICU stay, and the less of length of hospital stay, they are significantly prolonged in the group one as compared to group two. Mortality of total eleven were noted. However. We have when we see mortality is high in group two, it is not significant as compared to group one. Uh, this is a table swing the level of TONF alpha taken at different time point and and the between the group one and the group two. So before by, by, we can see that the in, in between group one and group two, there is no significant differences. However, uh, after at T2 point, just after coming to by, coming after bypass, there is significant rise in the level of TNA and DNA alpha in both group one and the group two. After 24 hours after bypass, the level of TNA alpha has decreased in the group one and the group two. As, although level has decreased from the T2, but it is still higher than the preoperative baseline value. So this is a graph showing the, the picture showing the level of TN alpha taken before sample at a T1 point and the length of hospital C. And we can see that the significant correlation existed between the uh, TN alpha level at T1 and the length of hospital stay with a p-value of 0.06%. And this line represents the line of s -fit. Now, a second graph, uh, TN alpha level at T2 just after bypass, so significant correlation with the length of hospital stay in the patients with p-value of less than 0.01%. And TN alpha taken after 24 hours at a T3 point also so significant correlation with the length of hospital stay with a p-value of less than 0 0.01 in the group 1. So in the group 1, all the time point T1, T2, T3, we have taken TN alpha and we have seen that a significant correlation existed between the T alpha level and the length of hospital stay. Now, we, this is a graph showing the cardiopulmonary bypass time and the TNF level at the T2 interval, and it has significant correlation between the bypass time and the level of TNF at the T2 time with p-value of 0.06%. This line represents line of best fit. Now, again, uh, uh, duration of mechanical ventilation has been significantly correlated with the length, uh, TNF alpha level at the level at the T2 point in the group one. And this line represents line of the best fit. And we have taken experiment correlation coefficient for this correlation test. So, uh, summarizing the fact that in group one, all the parameters were significantly associated with the level of TNF alpha. However, in the group two, any time at any time point, why we have taken TNF alpha, there is no relation between the post operative outcome. 
discussion many studies has been done to see the effect of T-alpha on the patient undergoing surgery with cardiopulmonary bypass. And we have taken a few that, um, for example, LNCK et al, they have showed the relationship between the inflammatory activation and the clinical outcome after infant cardiopulmonary bypass. And they have, they have concluded that the greater preoperative cytokine level did not correlate with the postoperative outcome, which is opposite of what we are getting in our study. Others cohort study done in China, or they have they have studied the T alpha level in children with coronary heart disease undergoing cardiopulmonary bypass, and they have said they they have uh, got results similar to us that they have said that the T alpha has increased after 24 hour bypass, and it is an important biological mediator. Now, considering the fact that T-alpha has multiple system of uh, involvement, uh, we have other uh, study to quote, like Gower Metal, they have targeted the pro-inflammatory cytokine T-alpha to elevate the cardiopulmonary bypass induced lung injury. And they have said that the uh, functional neutralizing antibody to T-alpha can actually reduce the bypass induced lung injury in the rapid model of bypass. And another study, they have suggested that the IL-8 and the T-alpha treated the acute kidney injury after pediatric cardiac surgery. And they have said that the children more than two years of age, they have higher chances of getting the acute kidney injury if they have a higher T-alpha or post-operative. Again, emphasizing the fact that we need to check on the T-alpha level so that the adverse effect can be overcome. So our highlights of our study, that we have a large sample size and 150 is a good number. And we have divided our group based on the age, that is less than 15 and more than 15 years of age, uh, taking, taking in the you know, taking the mind because the patient who are younger, they have a greater chance of damaging effect of bypass because of their image organ system and larger, larger circuit to patient ratio. There are some limitations of our study that we have taken only the T-alpha into account, and but it is a, just a part of whole spectrum of SRS. And other component like complement activation, platelet activation, and insulin, they are not taken into account. And we did not, did not study the impact of targeted anti-inflammatory therapy. And no perioperative echocardiography has been done to discern the perioperative RV or LP failure to correlate with the T-alpha level. So to conclude, level of t alpha correlates significantly with the duration of mechanical ventilation and a drop use ICU stay in the children less than 15 years of age. And it is an important prognostic matter. We can help in improving the outcome of or following the ICR. And further study taking into account a entire spectrum of inflammatory response, including the targeted anti-inflammatory therapy, would be required to identify patients at high risk of exerted inflammatory response. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashmi Singh. We now move on to our next presentation and the topic here is a decision tree approach to airway management pathways in the 2022 difficult airway algorithm of the american society of anesthesiologists and it gives me great pleasure to welcome dr william rosenblatt who's professor of anesthesiology at the yale university school of medicine in usa he's also the director Head and Neck Anesthesia at the Yale New Haven Hospital, and he's the past president of Society for Airway Management. Over to Dr. William Rosenblatt, please. Hello, I'm Dr. William Rosenblatt, Professor of Anesthesiology at the Yale University School of Medicine. And I want to thank the ICA for this invitation to speak to you, and especially Dr. Muralidar and Dr. Kumar for their very kind invitation. What I wish to talk about today is the 2022 ASA Airway Management Infographic, specifically Part 1, the Decision Tree Tool. I wanted to let you know about one of my favorite academic endeavors, and that is the Airway on Demand uh, workshops, and especially the Airway on Demand YouTube channel, where you can find over 265 videos, the channel has over 70,000 subscribers and 33 million views to date. Many of you are familiar with the ASA Difficult Airway algorithm, which was first published in 1993 and then again in 2003 with the addition of superglottic ventilation. In 2013, video laryngoscopy was added, and the big change in the 2022 version of the ASA Difficult Airway algorithm was the addition of the decision tree tool, which helps the clinician choose between the two major pathways of the ASA algorithm, and that is the intubation attempts while the patient is awake and intubation attempts after the induction of anesthesia. As part of this publication, the ASA Difficult Airway Task Force also included the Difficult Airway Infographic, which many of us on the task force feel 
is a better way to illustrate the different pathways and the choices between these pathways. This is the complete difficult airway infographic, but the focus today will be the first part of the algorithm, and that is the decision tree tool. Now, very importantly, each assessment of these four questions should be made by the clinician managing the airway using their techniques of choice and in consideration of their experience and available resources, including the aid which is available to them, what clinicians are available to help them, and in what context in which the airway management will occur. This last issue is very important because we know from the ASA Closed Claims Project that the same patient being taken care of in two different venues, let's say the operating room versus the GI suite versus the radiology suite, the outcomes with airway management may be different. That is, there's more morbidity and mortality outside the operating room given the same patient characteristics. Now consider two clinicians who are evaluating the same patient. These clinicians have different training, different experience. They're taking care of the patient in a different setting as we spoke about a moment ago, and they have available to them different clinicians who can aid them and different equipment. One clinician might choose to use the pathway for airway management after the induction of anesthesia, and the other one might consider an awake intubation. Which one of these clinicians is correct? Well, the argument made by the ASA Difficult Airway Task Force and the algorithm you're about to see is that both are correct given evaluation of these various factors. Let's look at these different questions. Question on evaluation, is there suspected difficult direct or video laryngoscopy and intubation? And again, this has to be based on the evaluation of the clinician who's going to take care of this patient in the context of what the device they wish to use on that patient, whether it be a direct laryngoscope or video laryngoscope, a different configuration of video laryngoscope, it has to be their decision. If the answer to this question is no, they don't expect any difficulty with laryngoscopy and intubation, they've come to the decision that when it comes to the archetypal airway management technique, that is tracheal intubation, they should not have any difficulty. In this case, they can induce anesthesia, whether that be a general anesthesia, a regional anesthesia, or a sedative anesthesia, and they might choose to use a tracheal tube, an LMA, a face mask, or nothing at all, because they know that if needed to be, they can always intubate that patient. Of course, this pathway, which we will not discuss in detail today, also provides algorithms for when the airway plan does not progress as expected. The prototypical case, rapid sequence intubation. Once we have made the decision that the patient is to be intubated and has a full stomach, we don't evaluate for other things such as the ability to mass ventilate. We know we plan to just intubate that patient and we feel confident in our ability to intubate that patient. Now, on the other hand, if the answer to this question on evaluation is yes, we now ask the question, is there suspected difficulty with ventilation with a face mask or a supraglottic airway? If on our evaluation, and that is the particular clinician taking care of the patient, evaluates this question as yes, we are now in the situation where there's the possibility of a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate scenario. In this case, we would never want to put this patient in a situation where we can't manage their airway and we would use an awake intubation technique. If on the other hand, we believe that there's no issue with ventilating that patient with a face mask or supraglottic airway, we now ask the question, is there a significant increased risk of gastro contents aspiration? That is, that in the situation where we're taking a little extra time to intubate that patient with an alternative technique, but we're able to ventilate that patient with our face mask supraglottic airway, we don't want to have that patient at risk of aspiration during that period. If the answer is yes, this is equivalent to a cannot intubate, should not ventilate situation. And once again, we would choose awake intubation. If the answer is no, we now ask the question, is there an increased risk of rapid oxyhemoglobin desaturation? This allows us to mitigate for error. 
What if we've made a poor judgment regarding the last two questions? Is our patient going to desaturate rapidly or suffer, or do we have time to correct our misjudgment? If the answer is yes, this allows us for error mitigation, and we once again can choose awake intubation. If the answer is no, we can enter into the ASA difficult airway infographics pathway for management of the airway after induction of anesthesia. What the decision tree tool allows is four inductive assessments which result in objective decisions. Provides clear operator-centered guidance and a post-hack rationale of the plan. The decision tree tool is only one part of the three-part ASA difficult airway infographic. The innovations of the infographic, clear, objective, and defensible decisions, ventilation determines airway success, flexibility is based on the individual operator. Thank you for your attention. I am delighted to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. William. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And of course, Dr. William has offered us uh, to take a full 50 minute talk on his entire paper in great detail, which will of course be of great value to all of us. We now move on to the next talk. And that is on quality of labor analgesia with a dural puncture epidural versus standard epidural technique in obese parturients, a double blind randomized control study. And this is being presented by Dr. Ashraf Samir Habib. Dr. Ashraf Habib is the professor of anesthesiology, chief division of women's anesthesia and professor in ops and gynecology at Duke University Medical Center. Over to you, Dr. Ashraf. Hello everyone. My name is Ashraf Habib. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, in the United States. First, I would like to thank the um, organizers for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar and to present uh, our study that was published in anesthesiology last year, discussing the quality of labor analgesia with the dural puncture epidural versus the standard epidural technique in obese parturients. So first I want to discuss why we did the study. As you all know, the prevalence of obesity is increasing worldwide. For instance, in the United States, it's projected that the prevalence of obesity would be about 45% by the year 2030. And the literature shows us that one neuroactive techniques are the preferred techniques for labor analgesia in this patient population. They are associated with a higher failure rate in obese compared to non-obese parturients as well as more attempts are needed to establish a successful neuraxial block in these patients. Therefore, neuraxial technique that optimize the success rate in this patient population are really important. So as far as neuraxial techniques for labor analgesia, we're all familiar with the epidural technique, as well as the needle through needle combined spinal epidural technique in which a spinal needle is passed through the epidural needle after identification of the epidural space, you get CSF back. This confirms that you are in the right place and your midline, you inject the local anesthetic mixed with a small dose of opioid, remove the spinal needle and thread the epidural catheter. So the benefits of Hello everyone, my name is Ashraf Habib. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina in the United States. First, I would like to thank the um, organizers for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar and to present uh, our study that was published in anesthesiology last year, discussing the quality of labor analgesia with the dural puncture epidural versus the standard epidural technique in obese parturients. So first I want to discuss why we did the study. As you all know, the prevalence of obesity is increasing worldwide. For instance, in the United States, it's projected that the prevalence of obesity would be about 45% by the year 2030. 
by the year 2030. And the literature shows us that one relaxer techniques are the preferred techniques for labor analgesia in this patient population. They are associated with a higher failure rate in obese compared to non-obese parturients, as well as more attempts are needed to establish a successful neuraxial block in these patients. Therefore, neuraxial technique that optimize the success rate in this patient population are really important. So as far as neuraxial techniques for labor analgesia, we're all familiar with the epidural technique, as well as the needle through needle combined spinal epidural technique in which a spinal needle is passed through the epidural needle after identification of the epidural space, you get CSF back. This confirms that you are in the right place and your midline, you inject the local anesthetic mixed with a small dose of opioid, remove the spinal needle and thread the epidural catheter. So the benefits of the combined spinal epidural techniques are that you get CSF back, therefore you confirm that you're on the right place, you confirm that you're midline. Also the puncture that you perform in the dura allows for translocation of local anesthetic that is administered subsequently epidurally, and this enhances the quality of the block. However, there are a couple of side effects that occur with the combined spinal epidural technique, including fetal heart rate changes, as well as hypotension and pruritus that can occur. So in an attempt to maintain the advantages of the combined spinal epidural technique while avoiding these side effects, the novel technique of dural puncture epidural was introduced, which is identical to the needle through needle CSE technique, except that after you get CSF from the spinal needle, you don't inject any intrathecal medications but you remove the spinal needle, you thread your epidural catheter and administer all your medications epidurally. This infographic was published with our study uh, summarizing the literature that uh, was published uh, prior to our study about the dural puncture epidural technique. I don't have time to go over all these studies, but what I would um, mention is that um, results have been inconsistent. And the benefit that has been mostly shown in this study that the onset of the block is faster with the GPE technique compared with the epidural technique. And some studies have shown that there's a better sacral sp spread and better bilateral block with the GPE technique compared with the epidural technique. However, this was not consistent in the different studies. With this background, uh, we decided to do this uh, study, our study, with the aim of comparing the quality of labor analgesia with the GPE technique compared with the epidural technique in obese parturians, because there were no studies performed to date that investigated specifically this technique in obese pregnant patients. And we know that these are the patient populations that are most likely to benefit from the suggested advantages of the GPE technique. And our hypothesis was that the quality of labor analgesia would be better with the GPE technique compared with the epidural technique. So we enrolled uh, women with a BMI of 35 or higher who were uh, at a cervical dilatation of two to seven centimeters and reporting pain score of at least four out of 10. These women were randomized to either a DPE technique or an epidural technique. And in the DPE technique, we perform the dural puncture with a 25 gauge Whitaker needle. After placement of the block, we initiated analgesia with 15 ml of epidural bupivacaine, 0.1%, with fentanyl 2 micrograms per ml. We collected data about the pain associated with contractions every three minutes for 30 minutes or until the pain score reported was one or less. We maintained analgesia using a programmed intermittent epidural bolus with the PCA using the same solution that was used for initiation of analgesia. And we had a standardized protocol for the management of breakthrough pain. The primary outcome of our study was the composite outcome of the quality of labor analgesia. 
And this composite outcome had five components, asymmetric block, need for top-ups, need for catheter adjustments, catheter replacement during labor, or catheter replacement or general anesthetic for cesarean delivery. Secondary outcomes were related to um, analgesia, basically pain scores and the pattern of PCA use, uh, sensory levels and motor block. We looked at adverse events, mode of delivery and satisfaction with labor analgesia. A power analysis suggested that 65 subjects per group will have 80% power at 0 0.05 um, to alpha to uh, show a difference in the quality of liver analgesia between the two groups. So here are our results. You can see here the baseline demographics and baseline characteristics of the patient in the two groups. And these were comparable between the two groups. The uh, median BMI was 41 and 42. Um, pain score at placement of the block was a median of eight, and the cervical dilatation was a median of four centimeters. Here is the primary outcome of the study. You can see here that there were no significant differences in the primary outcome of the composite of outcome of with quality of labor analgesia between the two groups. And this was uh, the case whether you look at the composite outcome on its own or, or its individual components of top-ups, asymmetric block, catheter adjustments, catheter replacements during labor, or catheter replacements or GA for cesarean delivery. Here are the secondary outcomes of the study. Again, there were no significant differences between the groups in any of the secondary outcomes, including the time to paint score of one or less, although there was it was three minutes uh, quicker in the DPA group, this was not statistically significant. There was also no difference in local anesthetic consumption, maximum pain scores reported, side effects including uh, hypotension, nausea, and pruritus. None of the patients developed post dural puncture headache. There were no differences in mode of delivery or in satisfaction with analgesia. So the strengths of our study include that it was a randomized prospective double-blind design, which minimizes the risk of bias. We use modern techniques for initiation and maintenance of labor analgesia, and we used a clinically relevant composite outcome to assess the quality of labor analgesia. Limitations of our study include the fact that all blocks in the study were performed by experienced provider. They were performed either by the attending anesthesiologist in most cases, or by fellows or senior residents or experienced nurse anesthetist. Therefore, the results might not be generalizable to situations where the blocks are performed by inexperienced provider. And we also powered our study for the composite outcome of the quality of liver analgesia, and it was not powered for block failure. So in conclusion, our study did not show that the DPE technique was superior to the standard epidural technique for labor analgesia in obese parturians, and further studies are needed to explore the optimal neuraxial technique in this patient population, especially uh, when the blocks are performed by inexperienced providers. This was an editorial that was published with our um, our study by Dr. Siegels and Dr. Penn, and um, they commented that the dual puncture epidural appears to be a clever idea in search of an indication. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf, for that detailed presentation. Uh, we now move on to the next talk, which is a comparison of the cardiac output measured by transthoracic echocardiography with continuous cardiac output measured by pressure recording analytical method. The paper will be presented by Dr. Nagaraj P.S., who is Associate Professor at Sri Jayadev Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences. Dr. Nagaraj, please. Good evening, everybody. Uh... I'm Dr. Nagaraj Piyas, 
was uh, presenting a paper on comparison of cardiac output measured by transthoracic echocardiography with pressure recording analytical method, which is also called a SPRAM. Low cardiac output syndrome, as we all know, it's a common complication following cardiac surgery and earlier identification um, ensures a prompt, uh, ensures a good oxygen delivery, better organ perfusion. And uh, most common modalities to assess the low cardiac output would be physical examination and lactate of venous oxygen saturation and echocardiography. When you speak about echocardiography, echocardiography is a non-invasive gold standard method, both in adult and pediatric patients. The limitation of this is, is the one-time measurement. It does not allow a real-time assessment of any medical intervention like inotropic therapy or a volume administration. So this is a paper in European Society of Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care in 2020, which says a recommendation uh, for the use of uh, cardiac ultrasound for the measurement of cardiac output and they recommend the use of uh, cardiac ultrasound to estimating cardiac output in stable patients and they recommend uh, invasive continuous cardiac output monitoring in unstable post-operative patients undergoing major cardiothoracic surgery. They also do not recommend the use of pulmonary artery catheter uh, to measure the cardiac output in children. So the search is on for an alternate to cardiac output estimation, which is accurate, continuous, but less invasive, with much clinical advantages. So this editorial in JCVA in 2021, which uh, spoke about uh, PRAM, which is Arterial Pulse Pressure Recording Analytical Method, which says that it's relatively new, minimal invasive, and based on different algorithms that analyze the waveforms from the pressure signals recorded from the femoral or radial artery, allows for the continuous measurement of the cardiac output. So the aim of the study was to compare cardiac output values derived from the transthoracic echocardiography with PRAM in post-operative pediatric cardiac surgical patients. The study design was a prospective observational study. It was conducted in post-operative pediatric cardiac surgical ICU with uh, 2 to 20 kg, uh, 2 to 20 kg pediatric cardiac surgical patients and open chest patients, arrhythmias and intracardiac shunts were excluded from the study. Patients who were enrolled in the study were connected to the PRAM monitor through the femoral artery catheter. Cardiac output and cardiac index, uh, cardiac index measurements were obtained simultaneously. And a simultaneous cardiac output were also obtained using a transverse echocardiography at various time intervals in the first 48 hours of post-operative period. A single operator performed all the all the um, transverse echocardiography. Five values were averaged, were taken and averaged. And apical five chamber and parasternal long axis were taken. Stroke volume was obtained by a product of LVOT area and VTI. Cardiac output was a product of stroke volume into heart rate. Cardiac index was cardiac output over body surface area. Statistical analysis, cardiac output and cardiac index values. Uh, Spearman correlation was used to determine the strength of relationship. Linear regression analysis was also performed to get the best fit formula. And coefficient of determination, which is R square, is uh, used for the proportion of variation between the two monitors. A bland Hansman limits of agreement was uh, was used to represent the bias, which is the main difference between the two monitors and the variability. That is, 95% of the limits or 95% limits of agreement was also been calculated. 95% limits of agreement was determined by 1.6 times the standard deviation. Polar plot was constructed to know the trending ability of the monitor. A total of 21 patients were enrolled in the study. 121 data sets were being analyzed. Spearman correlation coefficient of cardiac output between the two monitors showed a very positive relation with an R value of 0.69, which is very acceptable. A linear regression equation showed that an R square of 0.46, which is not that great. So cardiac output between transthoracic and PRAM showed a bias of minus 0.397 with limits of agreement being a little wide minus 2 to plus 1.22. Cardiac index bias was even more higher than the cardiac output with wide limits of agreement. This is a, this is a bland element plot of analysis which showed a mean and the limits of agreement being very wide. Polar plot analysis showed for cardiac output an angular bias of 6.55 degree and the limits of agreement, the radial limits of agreement was minus 21.46 degree to plus 34.58 degree. When we saw the um, uh, polar plot graphs, they had an uh, angular, they had an angular bias, which was well acceptable within five, five to six degrees. And uh, the um, limits of agreement was within plus to minus 30 degrees. This was a review, the review of the literature or the literature review on the PRAM, which was published in 2017 in JCVA, which shows that the PRAM was a monitor which analyzed the forward wave, which is the F, F wave, which is which is generated by the LV stroke 
it will be stroke encountered the backward wave which is the b wave from the periphery generating a specific profile represented by a series of points of instability so these are called as points of instability p or i these are points of instability and the the stroke volume is obtained by the area under the systolic component over the dynamic impedance that is at over zt to precisely identify the point by point pressure wave profile the frequency of prams recording is 1000 points per second so that's why it's so precise the unique feature that identifies specific pressure trace points that is points of instability are distributed among the both systolic and diastolic and representing a mix up of the forward waves and the backward waves so cardiac output, uh, this was a paper, an Italian paper in 2004, um, which compared uh, trans thermal dilution versus, uh, thermal dilution versus pram, 28 patients in CABG patients they compared, 112 measurements were obtained, they, they saw a very good correlation, R score of 0.78 which is very good, and uh, bland management showed a bias of only 0 0.027 with a narrow limits of agreement, present, showed, present you know that it was uh, 0.69 was the correlation and bias was pretty high with them. So this, the reason for this was a homogeneous CFG patients where stable conditions were uh, selected for these patients. That is why they demonstrated good agreement. So there's another paper which demonstrated pram versus thermodilution in unstable patients after cardiac surgery in the JCBA journal. This was in 2013. 94 measurements were taken and they included the patient with inotropic drugs and intra uh, IABP as well. And the mean was pretty similar with both the, both the, both the monitors. And uh, when we saw the mean bias, it was also very less, that is 0.47 plus or minus um, 0.395 with the narrow limits of agreement. Percentage error was very important. It was around 29%, which was well within the limit. But when we compared these patients to when they had atrial fibrillation, the percentage error rose up to 70%, nearly 69%, which is not acceptable. So they concluded in hemodynamically unstable patients, there was a good agreement between PRAM and thermodilution, but when they saw it in uh, atrial fibrillation patients, they had no good agreement. There was this patient, there, there was this uh, paper which compared in pediatric cardiac surgery, and they showed that 13 children were enrolled in the study, and uh, the R wave, uh, the coefficient R value was 0.93, which was very good. R square was 0.86, which was very good. Hence, they concluded that it was interchangeable. The interchangeable of cardiac index values between the prime and the, the this was the paper with compared with that of the fix fix uh, fix principle. So they had an interchangeable in the comment. This is the last paper which I would be discussing. That is a critical care medicine in 2016, which compared echocardiography and the prime values. And they, this is a multicentric study which assessed a total of 400 paired echocardiography cardiac output values and the most care values. And uh, it showed an R value of 0 0.85, which was very good. And uh, the bias was around only 0 0.03, which is very narrow. I mean, uh, the limits of agreement was pretty wide. That is minus 1.54 to 1.47. And uh, they showed it could be an alternative to echocardiography to assess that cardiac output was the conclusion of the study. So the present study had 121 data sets. Correlation coefficient was very good. That is 0.69 was not bad. Linear regression equation shows an R square of 0.46, which is uh, not greatly acceptable. Bland Anthman plot for cardiac output bias of minus 397 with a wide limits of agreement was not at all acceptable and this monitor was not interchangeable. Um, the polar plot analysis showed an angular bias was well within acceptable limits for 6.55 degree with the radial limits of agreement uh, minus 21 to plus 34 for both cardiac output and cardiac index. So to conclude pram cardiac output and cardiac index values are not at all interchangeable when we compare the absolute values to the absolute values and uh, but they showed a very good trending ability when you look at the trending ability trending values then you can actually bank on pram monitor. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Nagraj, for a wonderful presentation. We now move on to the next speaker, and that is Dr. Nishant Rajadiksh. Dr. Nishant is an IACTA fellow at Narayan Hospital, Bangalore, and he will be speaking on new insight into right ventricular dysfunction in COVID-19. Dr. Nishant, please. New insight into right ventricular dysfunction in COVID-19. The severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, that is SARS-CoV-2, was responsible for over 100 million patients within the first year of the pandemic. 
it affected the myocardium in 20 to 40 percent of the COVID positive individuals, out of which 40 percent suffered from right ventricular failure. The mortality observed was 48 percent in patients with right ventricular failure in COVID-19 infection. In such a grave situation, clinicians were in search of an imaging modality that had a greater predictive accuracy and at the same time was non-invasive, quick, reproducible and economical technique to determine the right ventricular function. The novel speckle tracking echocardiography is one such technique studied worldwide. The aim of our study was to assess the right ventricular function using echocardiography and compare the right ventricular parameters in survivors and non-survivors of COVID-19 infection. Our objective was to determine the predictive accuracy of right ventricular parameters with respect to the need for ventilation and 30-day mortality. Institutional ethics committee clearance and patient consent was obtained. A prospective observational study was conducted at a tertiary care center in southern India. Bedside transthoracic echocardiography was performed on the day of ICU admission by an experienced sonologist and assessment was done using an automated strain software by an experienced cardiologist. For, patients were followed up for a period of 30 days. The parameters under assessments were tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion or a TAPSI, right ventricular ejection fraction, right ventricular free wall strain length and right ventricular four chamber strain length, which is also sometimes referred to as global strain length. The inclusion criteria were all adults above 18 years of age who were admitted to the COVID-19 with COVID-19 critical infections in the critical care unit. The exclusion criteria was prior history of RV dysfunction or diseases known to cause RV dysfunction, valvular heart disease, implantable pacemaker and bundle branch block. According to the previous study, the minimum sample size required was 98 and after application of appropriate statistical test, these are the results. Amongst the 101 recruited patients, 57 patients survived the disease. The mean age of patients admitted was 48. The mean age of survivors was less than that of non-survivors. All the non-survivors developed acute respiratory distress syndrome during their ICU stay and hence the requirement of ventilation in this group is significantly high, thereby increasing the duration of ICU stay when compared to the survivors. The strain parameters under evaluation were significantly reduced uh, in the non-survivor group, but when the ROC, uh, AUC ROC curve was plotted, uh, predicting the need for ventilation and mortality, these are the results. The predictive accuracy of the strain parameters were over just over 90% to predict mortality and need for NIV and mechanical ventilation, whereas the same for the conventional parameters were limited to around 10%. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first Indian study to assess the right ventricular function using the conventional and strain parameters in COVID-19 pandemic. It is of profound significance to identify patients uh, who are at a higher risk of poorer outcome and potential candidates requiring ICU care and close vigilant monitoring to improve the overall outcome. Previously, markers like interleukins, ARDS and male gender were known to be associated with poorer outcomes. There is a significant high male preponderance in the ICU admissions and mortality in our study as well. And this finding is congruent with many other studies conducted during the same period in the COVID ICUs. Conventional eco parameters like tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion represents the movement of the base of the right ventricular free wall. The modified Simpson method is largely dependent, image dependent and results in a higher inter-observer variability. Moreover, they have lower predictive values. On the other hand, strain parameters evaluate the deformation of individual fibers in the myocardium in all possible directions, that is longitudinal, radial and circumferential using automated strain software. This results in good inter and intra observer reproducibility and greater predictive accuracy. Speckle tracking echocardiography demands good quality imaging, high end machine and specialized training. There are several limitations to be considered in this study. 
a comprehensive assessment of right ventricular function should have also included tissue doppler and fractional area change a longitudinal analysis with uh, a series of echocardiographic assessment would have provided a better insight into uh, on the cardiovascular impact of covid-19 infection we think that unprecedented pressure on healthcare providers that resulted from an exponential increase in the clinician's workload could partially explain this apart from this technical difficulties to perform bedside echocardiography in the icu along with wearing the personal protective equipment and all this coupled with human factor like a fear of prolonged exposure to a highly transmissible and fatal disease made the complete assessment of cardiac functions impractical hence the relationship between right ventricle and left ventricular dysfunction could not be completely explored conclusion right ventricular strain parameters like right ventricular free wall strain length right ventricular four chamber strain length are better predictors of the requirement of non invasive ventilation mechanical ventilation and 30 day mortality in patients suffering from covid-19 infections admitted to the critical care units this are the these are the references thank you uh thank you dr nishant and we understand the limitations under which you have done your study we now move on to the last topic for the day and uh this paper is something which we all love to use and that is tranexamic acid in patients undergoing non cardiac surgery and it will be presented by dr p j deveryu dr p j deveryu is a cardiologist a periop care physician and a clinical epidemiologist he is the director division of perioperative care at mcmaster university he is also the associate deputy director of population health research institutes and he has many such achievements more achievements to his credit Good day. My name is Dr. Pj Debro from the Population Health Research Institute at McMaster University in Canada. Thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Perioperative bleeding is a common complication in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Tranexamic acid (TXA) is an anti-fibrotic drug that may safely decrease such bleeding. We undertook the POISE three trial, which was a randomized controlled trial. It was an investigator initiated. Trial that had blinding of patients, healthcare providers, data collectors, and outcome adjudicators. We included patients that were age 45 years or greater undergoing inpatient non-cardiac surgery and were deemed at risk for bleeding and vascular complications. Patients were randomized to receive TXA 1 gram IV bolus or placebo at the start and end of surgery. Follow-up was complete for 99.9% .9 of the participants at the 30-day follow-up. The primary FCM point at 30 days after randomization was a constant life-threatening major critical organ bleeding, referred to as the constant bleeding outcome. And the primary safety endpoint at 30 days after randomization was a constant myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery, NINs, non-hemorrhagic stroke, peripheral arterial thrombosis, and symptomatic proximal venous thromboembolism referred to as the constant after outcome. Our primary efficacy hypothesis was that TXA was superior to placebo for the composite bleeding outcome, and the upper bound of the two-sided 95% composite all for the hazard ratio is the fall below 1.0, and the two-sided p-value less than 0.05. The primary safety hypothesis was that TXA was non-inferior to placebo for the composite vascular outcome, and the upper bound of the one-sided 97.5% composite all for the hazard ratio needed to fall below 1.125 with a one-sided p-value being less than 0.025. We randomized 9,535 patients from 114 centers in 22 countries. The mean age of participants was 70 years of age, and we had a good split between um, males and females. In both the TXA and placebo groups, 96.3% of the patients received both doses of the study drug. It was very good compliance. For the primary efficacy endpoint of a composite bleeding outcome, this was reduced with tranexamic acid. This occurred in 433 people in the TXA group, that is 9.1%, versus 561 events in the placebo group, that is 11.7, has a ratio 0.76, a result that is highly statistically significant. For the primary safety endpoint, um, the composite vascular outcome, 
This occurred in 649 patients of the TXA group, 639 patients of the placebo group. So with just under 1,300 events, it was only an absolute difference of 10 events between the two groups. The hazard ratio was 1.023, a result that is not statistically different. However, the non-inferred p-value fell just above 0.025 and 0 0.04, and our upper confidence boundary from 1.142 was slow at our 1.25 threshold. Based on the constant vascular outcome results, the hazard ratio of 1.023 and the 95% confidence boundary, there's a 95.6% probability that the primary safety ratio is less than 1.125. And a 4.4% probability of the hazard ratio is greater than or equal to 1.125. Secondary bleeding outcomes of BIMS, that is bleeding independently associated with mortality after non cardiac surgery, was significantly reduced with transemic acid. Hazard ratio of 0.76, a result that's highly significant, and major bleeding was also equally reduced with transemic acid with a hazard ratio of 0.72, a result highly significant. Looking at tertiary bleeding outcomes, ISTH major bleeds and transfusion of one or more units of packed red blood cells. Again, we saw highly statistically significant reductions in these bleeding outcomes with TXA. Tertiary endpoints and vascular endpoints, we saw no difference um, between the TXA group and the placebo group for these outcomes. The other tertiary endpoints, um, which included renal, seizures, infection, length of stay, disability. We saw no difference between the two groups, TXA and placebo. Additional transfusion data, looking at transfusions of two or more units of packed red blood cells or transfusions of two to four units of packed red blood cells. Again, we saw highly statistically significant reductions um, in these uh, transfusion results with TXA compared to placebo. In conclusion, among patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery, TXA reduced the risk of a composite of life-threatening major and critical organ bleeding. And although TXA has no significant effect on major vascular complications, non-inferiority was not established. Our results, however, also demonstrated the 95.6% probability of the primary safety outcome as a ratio is less than 0.125. Implications, healthcare providers and patients will have to weigh a clear beneficial reduction the composite bleeding outcome with an absolute difference of 2.7% um, versus a very low probability of a small increase in the risk of a composite vascular outcome. Absolute difference of 0.3%, again, a result that was not statistically significant. Majority of patients having non-cardiac surgery do not receive TXA. Annual global shortages of 30 million uh, blood unit products occur annually, and surgical bleeding accounts for upwards of 40% of all transfusions. Given that 300 million surgeries occur worldwide annually, voice we identify as the use of TXA could avoid upwards of 8 million bleeding events resulting in transfusion on an annual basis, indicating the potential for a large public health and clinical benefit if TXA becomes standard practice in non cardiac surgery. We published these results in Brain and Journal of Medicine last year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Deveryu, for a wonderful presentation. This paper was listed as amongst the top practice pa changing papers last year. I thank all the speakers for being crisp, adhering to the time, and for bringing up lively presentations. I now hand over the proceedings to Dr. Muridhar Kanchi for the panel discussion. Uh, thank you. I agree with you. They were crisp and uh, to the point presentations. Very well done. All the presentations were uh, high quality and I request all the panelists to switch on their um, videos and mics and uh, look at the chat box if there are questions otherwise we can do a panel discussion amongst ourselves any questions you have or comments you have please feel free to use this podium can I request uh, all of you to switch on your uh, videos and then uh, uh, comments or questions may be directed to the particular uh, study. Dr. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful uh, occasion in the last one and a half of, of listening to such great speakers in varied topics of uh, different aspects of anesthesia, critical care and cardiac anesthesia also. Um, would like to congratulate all the eight, nine of them. Wonderfully done and a great insight into the practice of what we do clinically today to our patient was very well brought out 
And I think all speakers were wonderful. So Hatius, congratulations on uh, doing a first of its kind, randomly picking up from ICU as well as OT, both cardiac and non-cardiac. Um, I particularly want to ask two papers, uh, some questions. And first question is to Dr. Ashraf, if he's there. It was a very nicely put paper. And uh, I just, since we are into the practice of using a lot of ropivacaine today, and we keep adding adjuvants to ropivacaine, and you beautifully in your paper uh, on analgesic effects of ropivacaine with fentanyl that you've used, two micrograms of uh, 1% of fentanyl. I just want to know, before you give the next drop off, how long did the effect of ropivacaine and fentanyl lasted in your patients till the next top up was given? Uh, you said there were two groups of catheter base and uh, epidural base. I think if I could get you right. And uh, secondly, what were the side effects that you envisaged with the analgesic effect of these two drugs in your patients uh, in the immediate post op? Dr. Ashraf, please. Is Dr. Ashraf available? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Ashraf? Dr. Ashraf, can you please unmute yourself and uh, respond to the question? Till he comes on in the last topic, since we see our uh, speaker from the last topic here, a small question to him. Did you envisage what we fear in cardiac anesthesia when we give a higher doses of tranexamic acid. Did you see in your non-cardiac surgical patient any incidence of seizures? So we had um, seizures, but the difference was not statistically significantly different between the two groups. Most research supports that there is an increased risk of seizures with tranexamic acid only at high doses, typically above three, milli, three uh, grams. We were using just two grams a day and we did not, it was a very uncommon finding and was not a significant increase in it. Great, that's uh, nice to learn. Thank you, thank you for that response. I would like to know if a, a patient with coronary artery disease undergoing non-cardiac surgery, would you like to give tranexamic acid to that patient? Yeah, so importantly in the trial, we had a lot of patients who had known coronary artery disease. Right. We did not see any increased risk in thrombotic events in those patients. Importantly is that a lot of perioperative myocardial infarctions are due to supply demand mismatch. Yes. yes. So bleeding is equally problematic for most of our patients with underlying coronary disease and Transamic acid is incredibly effective at preventing the bleeding. So I think on balance, the evidence is overwhelming that transamic acid has benefit and we're not seeing any significant increased risk um, with these patients. So I think, you know, um, given what we know, given the amount of events that we see here, it should become a standard practice for our patients. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Thank you so much. Another question for Professor Devro. Yes. Uh, has anybody yes. used uh, tranexamic acid in a volunteer study to show if there's any problem with vascular thrombosis or anything like that? Yeah, so just to be clear, FOIS-3 was a volunteer study in the sense that everyone had to give consent to participate. Um, there is now um, data from tens of thousands of patients in big trials with transamic acid. And the overall data demonstrates no increased risk in thrombotic events with transamic acid. Um, in POISE-3, we did have patients that were also getting carotid endarterectomy and peripheral arterial surgery. There will be another paper that's gonna come out specifically focused on that subgroup, um, but all the patients were volunteers. They all gave consent to participate. Thank you. Thank you. In the second presentation on uh, pregnancy and hypotension, use of phenylephrine and norepinephrine, 
when the heart rate came down to less than 60 per minute, what was the strategy you had? What was the, did you uh, treat that condition? Was it mentioned? I didn't uh, get that point. Yeah, uh, so we uh, defined bradycardia as uh, heart rate less than 50 per minute. And right. for heart rate less than 50 per minute, we gave atropin. We gave right. uh, atropin. Right. And only one patient in uh, both the groups had uh, bradycardia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Anjali, can I ask you on the same subject? Yes. Uh, yes. Normally, normally, we use phenylephrine and we are scared of bradycardia. So we do uh, also with phenylephrine. We, that's how the study of 2017 came up uh, where they mentioned that norepinephrine could be better than phenylephrine. And uh, you said in your study, you did a wonderful case series and saw that both of them were equally efficacious. I just want to ask you, uh, did you in any of your studies use in a LSCS patient ephedrine? Because many people have this tendency to add, to prevent the spinal induced hypertension, to add ephedrine to phenylephrine. We've seen it very often. Ephedrine was commonly available once, then it goes out of the market. So was there a need to prevent the bradycardia associated with phenylephrine to add anything to phenylephrine like ephedrine? No, ma'am. We, uh, we don't use ephedrine as such regularly in our practice. And uh, even here, we didn't use ephedrine at all. But ephedrine is not indicated anymore. Yeah, I know. yeah it's, uh, it's not uh, considered... Uh, drug of choice for obstetric uh, hypotension. Agreed, but yeah. uh, any, the literature still holds ephedrine as one of the important things because in many places it is available. And that's how norepinephrine came up as a replacement mm -hmm. just to avoid this bradycardia. Yeah. But a good study correlating the two as Thank equal. You. Thank you. One more question, uh, Dr. Mulita, can I ask my last question to a very good um, study done by Dr. Nagraj P.S. And this was on the use of PRAM. Uh, Dr. Nagraj, after the end of this uh, study, what all kind of patients would you want to put PRAM in over and above? In this era, when we are looking at microcirculatory flow induced, very low cardiac output to be monitored, uh, and we are preferring the completely non-invasive cardiac output measurements to minimally invasive cardiac output measurements, which we've been using in the last decade. Where would you put PRAM in the category of patients to be used with low cardiac output? Dr. Mm -hmm. Nagyan, so if you're yes, there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> hey, good evening, all. Um, uh, the PRAM as such is a plug and play monitor. So it doesn't need a calibration. It's a non calibrated machine as uh, compared to other non invasive or semi-invasive or less invasive uh, cardiac output monitors. So PRAM has got a very good trending ability as per the study what we have conducted. In contrary to the other study where the bland management plot mean bias was pretty less in other studies, but the mean bias was pretty high. Say it was uh, roughly around 400 ml as compared to the absolute values when we compare to echocardiography as well as uh, the PRAM values. So we don't, in the present study, we can conclude that the, they cannot be interchangeable because the absolute values don't correlate with each other. But the polar plot analysis says that the trending ability, say if the cardiac output has decreased, say the cardiac output, the value is 4 liters and it is decreased to 3 liters, then that is the point where we need to act because it has decreased at least some 30% from the previous value. So the trending ability of the cardiac output is the one, the take home what I want to give from Prem. And uh, in most of the pediatric cardiac surgical patients, it correlated well, ma'am, because we took the data sets where the hemodynamics have changed. It is not that the, the hemodynamics were stable. When the hemodynamics changed, we have taken the values. The data sets were obtained only then. So it pretty well correlated with the trending abilities and the, the um, volume administration. So the real-time correlation was well obtained with it. So let's say in trauma-induced shock, very low cardiac output, or in cardiogenic shock, uh, low cardiac output, or in an IABP patient, low cardiac output, you would want to use a PRAM. But would you like to use a PRAM even in a right ventricular dysfunction? A lot of literature coming up on controversy for the same. Right. 
yes so uh, pram actually deals with mostly the lv systolic waveform and the backward waveform so that is why the right ventricle actually is uh, there is a controversy in right ventricular dysfunction uh, correlating with pram ma'am you are absolutely right yes. so so that's what uh, when we look at new monitors every monitor has a limitation we've been with monitors last 30 years uh, dr mulidhar must have used maximum in the country but i uh, using them in the last two and a half decades i personally feel every new monitor should be used with a lot of caution and for rv dysfunction pram is a big no no and the beauty of pram is that uh, though it gives us a trend and your uh, polar plot showed it more than the bladman a uh, bland altman plot but uh, when you see the bias and you see very low cardiac outputs then low cardiac output mm -hmm. only of the lv so cardiogenic yeah. shocks iabp mechanical devices like ecmo it's a very beautiful thing and i yes. think we should use it thanks okay. a lot thank, thank you thank you thank you uh, one question to dr monica have you used this modular training in your setup and uh, what was the input from the uh, the training point of view good evening yeah we are using it i think maybe ma'am uh, would be better answering this question because she's the one who started it yes. in our university yes. and for the last i think maybe 10 odd years so we are doing the cardiac and the respiratory module very successfully and uh, i do feel it does make a difference do the students like it i mean the trainees like it yeah yeah absolutely they feel yeah. because the whole uh, the whole thing comes together in that particular two months so they do get a you know better otherwise they get posted to different uh, theaters so right. some get more of cardiac some get less you know you can't really equalize it so this part right. thank you Also, Manika, do you do you add or give study material as references or recommended material to these students in those two months period? Uh, Ma'am, we we recommend the books at the beginning only. When we start our theory, we tell them that these chapters are from this particular book would be better, and uh, we leave it to them also. A lot of them, most of them are you know now. instead of books they love to do the google and the internet only you know, so, so our experience at tss we found that advanced uh, recommended material adds value to them and they love to read it online and those online links are more more uh, exactly yeah, exactly <laughs> right it's a very right. interesting thing you've added and congratulations to your team thank you i also have a question on this that yes when you are having these modules what is the timing of the modules like in the three year uh, period what is the timing of each module two months ma'am then in so, night timing i mean at what time of training do they get it like we started on day one yeah, then start with one module right and we finish it by one and a half years so what happens is when the second batch comes in they join at the seventh module so that is why the importance of independent module is there so that you can join in with any independent module so it's not mandatory ke wo jaise pehle wale ne physiology first uh, pharmacology kari so the other person on uh, would join on the seventh module whichever uh, according to your schedule you are running it so they are all independent and then they'll do uh, from 7 8 9 and then go to 1 2 3 4 5 6 if okay. you can understand what i'm trying to say so that yeah, is yeah how... actually yes uh, it's it's like this uh, when whenever this these modules are started so the first year would be the one most having the most benefit of that because he will be uh, covering all those two rotations of one and half years till he uh, appears for the he or she appears for the final exam but at that time when first it is initiated the second years they'll be going towards third years and first years would be going towards second years so they will have uh, they won't be having a rotation which is completed but once it is started and incorporated in the system curriculum system then every resident would be completing two rotations for the full syllabus 
and because at the end of two months there is a formative assessment and summative assessment so they compile all together independently and once a module is completed in two months assessment is done after that we proceed on to the second module after that formative and summative is then and once what we are planning once three modules are covered that means after six months there should be a summative assessment of all these three modules also so that they don't forget uh, about uh, those previous modules so that way overall there would be 18 formative assessments and uh, besides that every six months summative assessment would be there and 18 summative assessments also there the main thing is regularization it a regular period of assessment is very much required which is lacked in our uh, system syllabus is huge where does the thesis research fit into this whole thing pardon ma'am thesis work research work that ma'am it has to go simultaneously Second, yeah <laughs> the first year the first year who's become who's uh, gone through 18 months rotation is completed he'll be revising and at hey, that time ma'am is asking about thesis thesis yeah, that's what i'm saying thesis is after uh, three months the performa should be provided uh, to the uh, student and after six months it gets uh, ad admitted to the ethical committee and clearance is there and uh, then there's enough time enough time for that this uh, topics may not uh, sort of uh, sync with the uh, rotations like somebody might be doing a thesis topic on obstetric anesthesia and he'll be posted somewhere else in the no, the posting posting is nothing to do with this this okay. is the yeah this is the uh, teaching program the teaching program which is being done so that have a they should have an a perfect knowledge for uh, their skills for monitoring because uh, the topics which are being covered in that particular module which belongs to a system all the applied basic applied sciences to that system then clinical anesthesia applicable to that system simultaneously all the equipments monitoring and drugs which are used in that system they are there moreover the journal club which falls in between that also belongs to that particular system recent advances it's it's, it's a providing a strong basis and assessments are always on the graded level for first years yes definitely faculty involvement is very important because they have to create all these uh, things we are um, in the process of uh, preparing these uh, modules for easy endorsement uh, with ICA so uh, let's hope because it will uh, give a regular assessment with a knowledge background to the uh, uh, trainees and there would be a feedback and you can judge I mean, uh, if uh, this is an average student, we should rather push why, what are the areas he's lacking? We we can uh, see to that. We used to do that in our institute and we were not having nine modules. We were having four modules, respiratory system module, serious system module, miscellaneous, which was covering all the modules, annual assessment, and then exam modules. In exam module, we used to have uh, all these uh, things together, but the feedback was very good. So that's why ICA helped us out. <laughs> that yes, it's it's something can be done with that. So we, we are really thankful. We are really thankful to uh, and, uh, ICA. Round of applause to you, Dr. Anita, as well as your team at at KGMC and ICA, because we started in 2016-17 only with cardiac critical care module and ours was online and it was open to nationals as well as internationals and now more than 14,000 fellows exist uh, 1400 sorry fellows exist uh, all over the country and about 2000 across the outside country from nepal from many places of SAC, where at a very low cost we give online modules and in subjects like cardiac critical care in ECHO, in ECMO, 
and in cardiac nutrition and patient blood management, I saw the super speciality of cardiac critical care grow because our modules were just online and uh, we would cover a subject over one year. Very different from yours and very uh, specifically subject bound. But I thought, as you were rightly saying, it strengthened their DM process. It strengthened their output at the DM Viva. Because once you've gone through that rigorous of 360 videos of exactly. echo, you can pick up any video, right? Mm. So, and, and I think uh, what I learned from you today is to add research. Even Dr. Kirti said it nicely. If we add a research module to the journal club modules, mm. yes. very well. So as teachers, probably online modules are the way forward. And I at least recommend them that uh, we soon incorporate them from AIMS as well. So kudos to you. Congratulations. Really well done. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think we are just uh, um, overshooting our time. If there's any important I mean, burning question, it can be taken up quickly. Uh, Is there any other question? Yes, madam. By Dr. Rosenblatt, uh, presented by Dr. Rosenblatt about uh, the ASA decision tree. That was yes. a, that's a very valuable paper because experienced people like us know that we need to paralyze the patient and they will probably do well when there is a difficult area. Right. Uh, giving it as a guideline is very important because the residents uh, need these guidelines. Right. And uh, therefore, these uh, protocols are very important for them. And yes. airway is the most important thing, the airway management. For yes. yes. So Dr. Is... Rosenblank, do you want to respond to that? Dr. William Rosenbart, are you available? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kirti, for your comments. And uh, I think the dinners are getting cold. We have to go for dinner. So I request, uh, I would like to thank all the participants for the excellent presentation and the panelists, come moderators for the discussion. I'm really grateful to them. And I would like to request uh, Dr. Baljit to yeah. say a, a vote of thanks to conclude this uh, third anniversary ICA webinars. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kanchi Mubidar. Well, what a remarkable uh, webinar it was, and I think it was befitting uh, the special occasion of uh, third uh, year of uh, ICA webinars that's been going on. Uh, the choice of topics uh, and the you know the speakers picked up was just uh, outstanding, and uh, all these uh, topics that uh, you've chosen. Uh, they have uh, implication in the way we practice anesthesia, at least in the future also we'll have, we'll uh, get to hear more and more about uh, these uh, topics. Uh, and then the, of course the spectrum of uh, the topics that we chose again was uh, very wide, uh, you know, range from modular curriculum, obstetric anesthesia, cardiac uh, arrest, registry, uh, tetralogy of fellow, airway management, wonderfully done. Uh, labor analgesia, cardiac output measurement, and cardiac dysfunction in COVID, uh, besides uh, another remarkable uh, article on tranexamic turn, uh, acid and non cardiac surgery. Uh, friends, uh, we have already most of time. I'm not going to take much time, but I uh, would like to uh, thank all the moderators. Uh, you know who who uh, moderated the uh, you know discussion very well, and of course wonderful speakers who gave their best. Uh, not only in the research that they contributed, uh, research that they had done, uh, and also the way they presented there. I know, uh, you know, the time for them was very, very short, but in those time, uh, in those eight minutes, they have, consent, uh, they, they have condensed the whole uh, topic uh, so that we can get a feel of what uh, a great research they have done. And uh, of course, I would like to thank the president, uh, uh, Dr. Yashiri Sood, for giving me the opportunity here. And thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, till we meet, uh, gentlemen and ladies. And special thanks, I must say, uh, to, to our uh, guests from the other side of the globe, Dr. Belani, our own dean uh, overseas, uh, Dr. Ashraf Habib, Dr. Devrio, Dr. Jasenblatt, who uh, had to get up very early uh, to, uh, to join this webinar. And of course, the Clarinet, who's been uh, the digital partner 
uh, with ICA. Thank you thank so much. Till we meet again. Thank, uh, thank next you. Week. I would like to thank okay. Vivek, Sanish, yes, and Rajiv. They have worked behind the scenes silently. Yeah. Dr. Vivek, Dr. Sanish, and yeah. Rajiv. No thank doubt. you. So we meet you again all. next week. Uh, take good care of yourself. See you next week. And good Thank night. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your valuable time and for being with us. Hoping to meet you again on the platform very soon for the next session. Sure. So with all your permission, can we conclude the session over here? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.